PS Kitchen is located at 246 West 48th Street, right in between Times Square and Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. PS Kitchen is dishing out sophisticated fare using fresh ingredients. They have signature cocktails, a late night menu, and a full event space upstairs. Check it out, ps-kitchen.com. They serve brunch, lunch, and dinner until 11 p.m. Sunday to Wednesday and until 2 a.m. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. It's plant-based and all profits go to charity. So check them out, ps-kitchen.com. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. To infinity and beyond. Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? It's classified. You talking to me? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I can't lie! Expecto Patronum! Entertainment X. You never know what you're going to get. For this episode, I sit down with Christiani Pitts, and we talk about her career. We talk about her life growing up, all the moving she did as a young child, and what brought her to a Bronx tale and is bringing her to King Kong. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did, and keep on keeping on. We are back, and today with me is Christiani Pitts. Yay! Christiani, <laughs> thank you for sitting down with me on this two show day. I am so excited. I mean, geez. Do you feel a difference um, energy wise from doing a two show day over a one show day with your track? Um, yes. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. Um, but oh, but not much. Not as much as I think one would think. Yeah. But um, it's only because we have a break between shows mm. and the break sometimes can get tiresome just because you're just kind of sitting there yeah. and you get a little too relaxed uh -huh. and then you have to get your energy back up for the second one. So yeah. that's like the only little. I always wonder that because again, so for people listening, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about a Bronx tale. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff. Nice. Uh, you're in it with my friend Alex Grayson. Yes. Who's, the, who's the bomb. Yes, he is. And he was talking to me about it. It's tricky with that in between shows. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not enough time to go home. Right. Unless you live in Nail's Kitchen. Right. Um, but it's like more than oh. enough time to completely become drowsy. 100%. So and then on, on Wednesdays, you know, the, the break is uh, from 4 o'clock to 6.30. Um, but on Saturdays, it's from 4 o'clock to 7.30. So that extra hour just really can be awesome like, if you have things to do or yeah. if you fall asleep, you're like, oh, gosh, I can't wake up. <laughs> oh, there it goes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's jump in. Um, yes. I'm curious, what was the first show you ever did? The first show I ever did was um, the Nativity Story um, at my church yes. years ago. Yeah. And I was cow number two. Cow number two. Cow number two. <laughs> Come on, cow number two. With a fierce tail <laughs> and fierce spots. And I had um, a, 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 the best time of my life. Yeah. Um, and that honestly, as, as kind of silly as it sounds, was the the joy I got from being that cow yeah. and, and just having so much fun with the costumes l was truly what kind of motivated me to, to try to do this more and more and more. Yeah. Um, and so then I went on to do, uh, you know, legitimate shows. And, and Once in this Island was uh, the first kind of show with a, a legitimate script and score um, mm. that I got to be a part of. Yeah. And I was little. Too, I've done it twice. And the first time I did it, I was baby to moon. Yeah. And the second time I did it, um, I got to be Big to Moon. Yes, you did. <laughs> um, was that, okay, so the nativity story, mm -hmm. was that like right there for you? You were like, this is what I want to do? Oh, this is it. Oh, that yeah. was the moment. That was the moment. That's incredible. That was the moment. And and I think because it was in church um, and, you know, we were in probably kindergarten and mm. no one, I remember taking it so serious <laughs> and people being like, girl, relax. You're a cow. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> relax. Like it's not about you. But I was like, I want to make sure people knew their lines and like, like I took it so serious. And yes. then I, that's kind of why I knew like, oh, this is what I want to do. Yeah. Like this is, it, this is, yes, it's fun for me, but I also find this to be incredibly serious and incredibly, you know, demanding <laughs> yes no yes and i when i saw you and we were talking about this beforehand mm -hmm. before we started recording mm -hmm. i was marveling at the aliveness of your scenes thank you and how present you were thank you because i know how much how many shows you've done mm -hmm. and will continue to do until you leave the show mm -hmm. and it's a lot 
Yeah. You know, Thursday, yeah. the 15th Thursday <laughs> of this show is like, oh my God. Right. So to stay present and have that mind and that work ethic, which is yes. what I want to talk about. I'm curious mm -hmm. what your parents taught you about work ethic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, um, my parents are two really special and incredible individuals and they both have um, pretty difficult pasts uh, and they never stopped living and they never stopped working and, and doing what they had to do to support my, myself and my sisters mm. um, so I truly feel like I have no choice but to be great for them mm. um, and uh, when it comes to, to kind of being alive I think being alive on stage and the work ethic I think kind of go hand in hand um, because I, I feel like it is my job to make sure that the audience feels like they are seeing this for the first time Yes. and so if I don't do my very best to get out there and, and be completely alive and open and, and listening to things as mm. if I've heard them for the first time, yes. I think I'm doing the audience a disservice. And, um, and I think that means that you're not working to your fullest potential. Yeah. So I find it really fun to get out there and figure out how to hear things differently or, um, you know, how, what would my mental state be today versus yesterday? And, yeah. um, and, and it helps yeah. become alive. Yeah, I heard uh, a while back when I was doing, I was asking like a mentor about being tired and mm. doing this many shows. Mm -hmm. And he had said to me, tonight is someone's first night ever seeing a live show. Mm -hmm. And tonight is also someone's very last time Absolutely. seeing a show. And I was oh. like, oh, wow. shit. <laughs> wow. How, how powerful is how that? How do you not, yeah, how do you not, how do you not give wow. everything? But now, okay, so with the parents mm -hmm. growing up, you had to balance schoolwork yes. and performing. Yes. What was their regimen? Well, I, I have yours. a funny story about my mother. So for when I started acting professionally, I was um, eight years old, and my mother was my manager. Mm. And she was really good about being on top of everything, make sure I got my schoolwork done and my you know, work work outside of school done, and she was great at it. Uh, around my junior year of high school, mm. I was uh, in school, taking my, all my regular classes. I was uh, the captain of my dance team, which which I, the North Atlanta Silver Stars, if you're listening, shout out to you, <laughs> um, which I took, again, very serious. Yeah. Um, and I was filming the movie Big Mama's House 3. Yeah. So I was busy, but I, I, had the, I was having the time of my life. Like mm. I, did, I had no regrets. One day I was called to be to set uh, at seven o'clock in the morning. Okay. Set was kind of far, so I had to be up around five thirty, six o'clock to get there on time. Well, my mother said that she thought I was so tired and that I needed a break. So she just didn't wake me up. She just let me sleep. She said, she said, I'm, you know, I can see the tiredness in you. I'm going to let you sleep. So she did not wake me up. So oh, my like body clock went like woke up at like eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock. Yeah. And I was freaking out and I was screaming and I like, I was like, oh my God, I'm so late. I'm going to get in so much trouble. And I got to set and it was fine. You know, everything was fine. But yeah. I remember sitting down and having the conversation with my mom after that, like, mom, I love you. This has been great, but you can no longer be my manager. <laughs> you can no longer, just because she, for the first time in the years that she was working with me, yeah. um, she let the mother you know, the mother part of her kick in mm. and she started standing up for me as a mom and not a manager. And, uh, but I think that just speaks to how caring she is and how much yeah. she looks out for me, but it didn't work out as far as being my manager. <laughs> so that was the last time we worked together like that. How old were you? I was, happened? uh, 16 or and 17. How did you know to have the like presence of mind to be like, okay, I need to separate this. I need to, oh, because I, remember feeling mortified okay. on the way from my house to set hmm. just because again since I was a little girl I've taken this so serious hmm. and I like I, I was just mortified that people were gonna because I was also the youngest person um, in the in the group of actors that I was working with hmm. so I was worried that they were gonna think you know I was too young and I was unprofessional and I hmm. I didn't want that and I knew that I loved my mom but I was like mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, you're not gonna catch me <laughs> okay mom this is not gonna work yeah. so Okay, I okay. knew it was time, but what was the um, what did they teach you about kindness? Oof. Well, in that same token, um, my mother um, is uh, she's been through she's been through a lot. Both of them. Let's see. My mother and my father. Uh, my father, you know, was raised by a single mom in Baltimore, Maryland. 
struggle was real. My mother was raised um, by her mother and father, and her father passed away when she was 15 years old. Uh, the struggle was real. Mm -hmm. Both of these people have grown up with nothing, yet they've always had the most open hearts and treated everyone with love and compassion, uh, and, it, and it's, it's served them their whole life. They've become better people for it. Um, so growing up, they, they tried their hardest to provide my sister and I with, with you know, more than they had growing up. Mm. Um, but when things didn't work out, that, work out that way, excuse me, and we didn't have everything we needed, kindness and love was still one thing that they made sure was always there. Mm. Always, no matter what. If you don't have money, you have love. If you don't have friends, you have love. If you don't have the nice clothes, you have love. Like that was just, mm. it, it was just abundant growing yeah. up for my sisters and I. And, and, and so here I am now as a, you know, working professional, yeah. um, you know, making more money than I've ever made in my entire life. Yes. Surrounded by some uh, incredible people. Yeah. And I can honestly say that whether I had this or not, I would still have so much love in my heart because I yeah. know what it feels like to have absolutely nothing and, and still love people and still be kind. And, and it, it, it brings me so much joy because yeah. I know now that no matter where I am in my life or my career, um, I will know how to treat people with the ultimate respect and, and love people as if they're my family. That's so beautiful. Oh my goodness, they're the best. You're bringing up a really great point. And this, I experienced, I don't want to say something similar. Mm -hmm. I experienced when I first moved to the city, mm -hmm. having less than mm -hmm. what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Almost like a reverse, you know, kind of weird, mm -hmm. in a weird way. Yeah. And it was so mind opening mm -hmm. to see the world differently and see love and compassion and how mm -hmm. little one truly needs to mm -hmm. be happy. Absolutely. It's fascinating. Which is, it's really fascinating because then once you have all of the material things, it's no, that's not your source of joy. Exactly. And, and I think it's, you, you know, we hear and see this all the time about people with all the money and resources in the world who are incredibly unhappy. Yeah. And that makes me so sad because it, it, that means that they were, they were missing something quite some time ago. Yes. You know what I mean? And they, and they never got it. And, and it, it makes me so sad because it's, I know that I'm happy with, with life because of the things that my parents have taught me about kindness yeah. and respect. And I really wish that everyone got that because mm. it, it, it shapes who you are as a person and it shapes how you treat people. Yeah. I, wa I read the news occasionally before bed. Mm. Ooh. But I know this is a funny thing. I stopped reading it because it's all designed for misery and oh, fear absolutely. and all of that. And I've now read it because it start, I started reading it again because mm -hmm. it fuels my fire hmm. to do this podcast mm. and to Come share on, these messages. Yes. Because, no, because like there are so many people who grow up without realizing, you know, what you've realized in your youth, mm -hmm. you know, what your parents taught you. Right. And I just think it's so interesting. And I talked to my best friend, Nikki, about this. I'm like, how do you, how do you spread happiness? Hmm. And I said that after I read a message, someone like... There was a murder involved, and I was like, Jesus, how do you spread happiness? And hmm. she's like, some people don't want to see that. Some people are not looking for that. Right. And it's how to how to just at least enlighten people to the fact that there, it is there. Yes. Happiness without, within yourself is mm -hmm. there, even if you don't have anything, mm -hmm. if you just look for it. Mm -hmm. It's what you focus on. It's what you find. <laughs> yes. My my good friend Janelle McDermott, she's uh, in the show. She plays Frida. Me and her were celebrating her birthday this past weekend, and we went mm -hmm. out to dinner. And uh, I was talking to her about some, some issues I've been having. And uh, she told me uh, some issues I've been having with someone. Mm -hmm. uh, and she told me, you have to love them through it. And I was like, Interesting. oof, oof. Mm. Uh, and I think that th that is something I want to keep with me for the rest of my time on this planet is love someone through it. Because we have no idea what people are going through at any given moment. Yeah. And sometimes we can present someone with happiness and with kindness and it's not reciprocated and we can be very confused and hurt by it. Yeah. But I think if we just internalize that and say, I'm just going to love you through it, mm -hmm. not only does it make us feel better, <laughs> but that person will be affected by that at some point in time. Maybe not in the moment when you did yeah. it, but later on they will sit back and they will realize that, that the way they were treating you and the evil that they were spitting out at you, you backed it up with love. You responded with love and and they're going to be better for it. Mm -hmm. So I love that. I, I, I love it, that. It, it changed the game. I love them through it. I said that I can do because yeah. that doesn't take anything for us to do mm -hmm. to love someone. That doesn't take much. It no. doesn't. 
Especially when your cup runneth over. Come on. Of energy <laughs> and love. No, seriously. Yes, I mean, that's, what, that's where you're operating from. Mm-hmm. And that's where I'm like, I wonder what techniques can you do to spread that for people who are looking for it? Mm. To show them how their cup can runneth over. Yes. And they can be so kind to someone who like yells at them about not having a bacon on a sandwich when it's never about the right. bacon. Right, It's exactly. about something that happened it's when they were a kid. Exactly. And they've held on to it for decades. And I you mean, are just sitting there getting it all. Yeah, but how do you, you love them through it. You love them through it, you love them through it, and you don't take things personal. Mm. And that is something mm. that I think is, you can apply as an as an actor. It's funny. Um, I think as an actor on stage, in order to get a kind of lively performance, yeah. it's important to take everything personal every little thing you take personal you let it hit you and you feel it uh-huh. my acting coach is, is hard on me about that uh-huh. um she thinks that i don't take things personally all the time on stage i just say oh he didn't they didn't mean that or, or that's not what she meant no no that's exactly what she meant and if you let it affect you and you feel it yeah. you can get a more lively performance now on the outside <laughs> world I, my tactic on, on dealing with people is to not take everything personal. Um, and I would, I would suggest that I would recommend that to people in their everyday lives is to not take anything personal um, and, and, and know that people are going through their own things and it has nothing to do with you. But if you're an actor, it is a fun acting technique to then reverse it and be on stage or be on film mm. and take it all personal. It, it feels different. Um, and it's yeah, really, it's yeah. rejuvenating. It's like it is. cleansing it in really a way. It really is. Like and then you like get out and you and you and you let it go when you're out in the streets. You let it go. You don't think about it. But then when you're in a space where you're like either again on camera or on stage and you mm-hmm. get to practice taking something personally, it it feels good. It's a it's, lot, but yeah. it can feel good. It's like indulging in that for yeah. a minute. And I notice some of the best actors and actresses in this world have an incredible grasp on their emotions. Oof, yes. The mm. best mm-hmm. grasp. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Because you cannot be Lucy Goosey Cannon Mm-mm. with, you know, when you're going through, you know, deaths on stage right. eight times a week. I mean, right. that's like intense. It's a lot. Yeah. Question for you. Mm-hmm. What did you want to be when you grew up? What did I want to yeah, be when I grew up? as a child. What did you want to be growing up? Well, d- always an actress. Okay. 100%. Okay. Um, and then there was a phase where I really wanted to be a marine biologist. Okay. I was, like, obs- I was obsessed with everything, sea involved, everything. And then I was watching The Animal Planet. And I saw a marine biologist have to save a shark. And she almost got bit doing it. And I said, nope, no more, no mm. more. Because when I thought marine biologist, I thought dolphins and penguins and seals. Starfish. And like, <laughs> starfish, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I didn't think sharks and alligators. And I said, so, yeah. no, thank you. Um, okay. But there was a phase where I wanted to be that. And then I wanted to be a soccer player. Um, but through all of that, all of those different I'd like to be's being an actress and a performer was at the root of it all. Yeah. The whole time. How do you stay fulfilled considering you've now done films, television, mm. Broadway? Have, did you set a goal as a child? Have you reached the goal? Do you no, have a new no, goal? No, no. My goal in life, if you will, is to become an EGOT. Yes. You know? Okay. Um, and, and it's such an insane, it's such, I mean, there's 13 EGOTs in the world. Yeah. Um, so it's a really, uh, it's a goal that I may never achieve, mm. but I set it for myself because I will always be reaching for something and I'll always mm. be doing work that is, uh, you know, possibly cool enough or creative enough to even be considered to win something like yeah. an Oscar or a Tony or a, and so I, I may never achieve it, but I, but I love that I've set a goal like that because it is going to constantly keep me you know, working and, and excited for something that could be. I'm curious if you'll indulge me for mm-hmm. a second. What would you do once you got it? Oh my if we could like just play that game for a second. I would call um, my queen EGOT Whoopi Goldberg if she'd okay. pick up the phone. <laughs> yeah. And I would just say, Whoopi, what did you do? what did you do yeah. what did you do next yeah um because you know Whoopi is an egot and yeah. and she st- hasn't stopped working period no um <laughs> and she seems to be uh incredibly vocal about her her politics and her beliefs and yeah. and is still out there spreading knowledge and and working and and she seems very happy yeah. so i would call her and yeah. say what's the key sis what, yeah. what's next what's next what's next no it's always that's always an interesting question to me because i wonder you know if someone wants to be an astronaut and they go all the way to the moon right some of them get depressed oh, because absolutely. it's like, what's next? what's next? What is, what is there left to uh, mm-hmm. achieve? Right. But having that fulfillment is like, so how do you balance achieve and fulfillment? Achievement and Ooh. fulfillment. Hmm. That's interesting. I think that 
it's very healthy to set goals. Yeah. Um, but I think that you have to, again, this, I think this kind of goes back to what we were talking uh, about before, about being happy, being happy and, um, and, and paying close attention to kindness. I think you have to make sure that whether you achieve your goals or not, you are happy. Mm. And I think that that means that you have to be fulfilled with where you are now. Yes. And I, I say that because if not, if you are just, you know, out there shooting goals, yeah, but not being fulfilled, then, then I think that you'll never be it? incredibly happy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But I, I think do. that if you are happy where you are now, yes. there's nothing wrong with still reaching and still climbing for your goals. But that way, when you get them, you will you won't all of a sudden be disappointed and upset with yourself. You'll be content. You'll be happy, and then you'll set new goals. Yeah, you know what I mean, and, and I keep climbing for something new. I do. Um, I love that because it's also you know thinking about my goal in particular. You know, being an egot doesn't mean that I would have enough money to buy my mother a house. It doesn't. Hmm. Um, so maybe if I was to achieve that somehow, okay, sure. My next goal, when? It, you know, when, when? come on, <laughs> my next goal would be to buy my mom the house of her dreams, or hmm. you know, to send my nieces and nephews off to college for free. Yeah. There are always things, um, but I think that as long as you are happy inside with where you are now, I mm. think that you will uh, constantly be fulfilled and you will never be um, kind of stagnant once you uh, achieve your goals. You'll yeah. never feel like you don't know where else to go. Yeah. You'll be happy to look forward to something new. Yes. Great answer. Thank great you. Answer. That was a great question. Did you, thanks, <laughs> did, you, did you and do you have mentors? Yes. Yes, um, I had some of the most incredible mentors that one could be blessed with. Um, one of my mentors, her name was her name was excuse me Linda Stevenson, and she was my acting teacher, my drama teacher um, in high school in Atlanta, Georgia, okay. from my freshman year to my senior year, and she was uh, like me. She took what she did incredibly serious Mm. and it was refreshing for me to um come to high school in atlanta and i had just moved so i knew no one Mm. um it was refreshing for me to get into this program that was led by someone who played no games who was treating our high school drama club like we were you know the the newest cast of the new tony award-winning musical or the new oscar award-winning film uh, you know, she treated us like we were professional working actors. And, yeah. and it was so refreshing for me yeah. because you had certain students who could care less. And she she never let that deter her from being someone who could change someone's life. Wow. Um, and I think that she recognized uh, how serious I took it. I think she saw that in me and um, paid a little close attention to me and, and helped me and became more than just a teacher and more so like a, a second mom and, and a mentor. And when I was looking to get into colleges, she helped me get my monologues together and helped me go over mm-hmm. my material. Um, and she was one of the first uh, people I let know that I got into Florida State University uh, for a music theater program. And she could not have been happier for me. Mm-hmm. Um, in the, what year? It, I was going into college. I believe it was my... Uh, sophomore to or excuse me, my freshman to sophomore year of college that summer mm. um she w- uh passed away from from cancer and uh it was one of the most difficult things i think i've ever had to process mm. um I, just because i i could call this woman to talk about anything i've ever needed mm. and she never made me feel crazy for taking what I do so incredibly serious and working so hard. She, she just made me feel like that was normal and that was what was expected of me. Yeah. Um, but I can say that I don't think that I would be where I am right now without her watching over me. I can genuinely feel her mentorship from heaven. I can feel it. Mm. I can feel it. Um, my other mentor was Antonio Sisk, who also um, passed away uh, after I graduated college. He was my dance teacher at at North Atlanta High School, again, incredibly serious. He he mm. t- he 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 made you feel like you were on your way to Alvin Ailey every time you stepped out of his class. He just he just yes. was and he was magnificent, um, you know. And and same thing. I can I can feel their their love and their work ethic like wrapped around me when I do certain shows and when I, um, you know, make certain mistakes. I can hear them saying like, "Now, girl, you know good and well." 
I taught you better than that. And, <laughs> it, and it, it, it gets me back on my A game. Yeah. Was there a mantra that he had? Um, anything see. like, did he repeat anything in class? Or Ooh. did you? Oh goodness. I'm sure they did. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. I mean, I just did put you on the spot. <laughs> no, <laughs> if it doesn't okay. come to mind. That's okay. Yeah, no, I, I can't. I mean, they were full of so much knowledge. Shows they were full of work ethic. so much. Yeah. I mean, just the bomb. I love, I absolutely love that. Oh, I, yeah. I want to know what does, speaking of dance, mm -hmm. what does dancing do for you? Mm. Dancing, I feel like this is going to sound cliche, but dancing like frees me up. As I'm talking to you right now, you can see my hands are like yeah. flying all over the place. Um, I'm such a, I'm very tall and I used to be very self-conscious about my height and how lanky I was. I felt very out of place all the time. And when I found dance as a little girl, I, I, I felt like I fit in somewhere mm. um, where, you know, whereas boys used to pick on me for being so tall and lanky in my dance class, they liked that I had long legs and I could get across the floor quicker and, mm. and I felt appreciated. Um, so I've always felt sort of comfortable um, when I was dancing, I felt like I was like my best physical self. Yeah. Um, and as an actor, it's made me become a very kind of physical, um, I interpret things in a physical way yeah. versus very like a mental or very kind of heady um, actor. I find it to be all in my body. Um, and, it, and I enjoy it because it's very relaxing and freeing. And, um, you know, it's just kind of shaped who I am and took me from being this kind of really uncoordinated lanky crazy looking girl to someone who has become graceful and mm. and i i'm so very clumsy but you know um <laughs> you know graceful and in yeah. in more control of, of my body is that your spiritual practice or one of your spiritual practices oh um you know it used to be i can't say that now it is because um it is legitimately my profession um i I don't find it as freeing anymore just because I, I'm constantly making sure that it's correct mm. and making sure that it's up to par. Um, it definitely used to be. Oh, my goodness. When I was in high school and college, it was 100% used to be. Um, I think now m my most spiritual practice is prayer at church and music. Mm. Um, I've always been a singer-songwriter for as long as I can remember. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, and because now I'm not being paid for it. Yeah. It's so freeing. It's yeah. therapy to write music. It's therapeutic. Um, once that, <laughs> once I start getting paid for that again, I'm sure I'll go. Do it. <laughs> we'll find a new one. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'll go back to dance. But um, yeah. With the, um, I read this thing about you that you don't just entertain, but you love. You don't just love to entertain. You love to inspire mm. through the arts. Yes. Where does that come from? Um, I think it comes from my my appreciation for being someone who was considered other and i think that i i think that you know uh, being a black woman in certain situations you are made to feel different or you're made to feel like an outcast and you know I, I know what that feels like, and I, I loved learning that I was beautiful, and I loved learning that I, I wasn't other. I was exactly who I was supposed to be. I loved that, oh, yeah. and I remember that it was hard getting there. Um, and so I like inspiring people uh, through my art because I know that there are people out there who feel like they just don't belong, and they feel like they're never going to be good enough, and I know that they are because we are all perfectly made in the, in the eyes of God, every single one of us. So I like... F finding what I can within myself to let others know that they're perfect and that they are 100% supposed to be where they are and that they are destined to do great things. And if I can inspire someone to know that, that then that I feel like my job is done. That's beautiful. Yes. And now speaking specifically on a Bronx tale, mm -hmm. the story in it, mm -hmm. I, it's shameful to say, I hadn't seen the movie. I no. saw parts of the movie. I hadn't seen it either before I booked the show. Let, let me once, tell you. Yeah, right. And then once I found out Alex was going to do it, and I was like, let me see this movie. Let me go see the show. Mm -hmm. I was, the message in it is yeah. incredible. Yeah. And that Chaz wrote that. Yeah. And that, that was written like a decade, two decades mm -hmm. ago. I mean, the movie is older. Oh, yeah. And that those stories are still being told. I just think it's so beautiful. Oh, it's absolutely. It's so important. Absolutely. And run and buy your tickets for a Bronx Tale now. That's oh, you guys got to go do it. It's awesome. It's great. It's awesome. And we've been blessed to be there for almost two years. Yes. Which is a blessing. Um, yes. You guys got to come check it out. 
It's yeah. it's that that uh, it's funny. It all goes back full circle. When we first started talking, yeah. we were talking about what it's like to choose kindness and to and to w- greet people with love. Yeah. Um, and one of the main themes in our show is choosing love over fear. And I think that is. I, I, I continue to see that come up in my life outside of the show. Um, I think people are so afraid of people who don't look like them or sound like them or come from the same economic backgrounds as them or come from the same country. They're just scared because mm-hmm. they don't know anything. And if you just treat them with love and an open heart, it, I mean, it'll, it'll like literally change the world. And in the Bronx tale, when he chose love over fear, it just changed his current situation he survived instead of uh choosing fear which would have ended his life yeah um but but that message can apply to so many different things in our world mm. it's i love doing that show eight so times timely. a week absolutely so absolutely timely. why i'm gonna flip around here a little mm-hmm. bit why did you move from you kind of partially grew up in new jersey and then moved to georgia yes why did you move well I, i'm actually so i'm from georgia originally oh okay no no but you had it right so okay. i'm from georgia decatur georgia okay when I was 10 years old, I moved to New Jersey to live with my father and my stepmother. Okay. And, um, you know, part of the reason was for a, a better school system, but I also had started working um, professionally and I was closer to New York City by living in New Jersey. Um, and so it was awesome because um, I got to live with my dad, who is such an incredible person and uh, got to see a little bit of his business. He's a, a news reporter and I and I got to little, see a little bit of how he works. Mm. Um, it was scary because I moved to f- from a place where my church was, my friends were, my mom was, yeah. to knowing nobody but my father. What did that teach you about opening your mind to Ooh. people who are different? Oof. Boy, it so much. Mm. Um, where I was from in Georgia, when you would meet a stranger, you'd ask them, hey, which church did you go to? Like, Southern Baptist. Everyone <laughs> within my community was Southern Baptist. Yeah. And I, it wasn't until I moved to New Jersey that I realized that asking someone what church they went to was borderline offensive because that was them and I was assuming yeah. that this person believed in the same exact thing that I did and uh. that they went, you know, they went to church. I didn't even acknowledge mosques or temples or, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I just, I just didn't know. It yeah. was, it was ignorance. So it taught me um, a lot about openness and about kind of being blank slates when you meet people and not assuming anything because even if you don't mean it from a harsh place it could it could be offensive um and and so yeah it taught me to be open I went from having you know only going to school with black and white kids in Georgia to going to school with people from all over the world in New Jersey um and it was incredible um yeah why did you move back down to Georgia so my what was it my uh eighth grade year yeah I finished middle school in New Jersey, and it was amazing. Huh. Um, but truth be told, I just I, I kind of miss my mom mm-hmm. and uh, my sister. My, I have an, I have two older sisters, but uh, my middle sister was going off to college, hmm. and I just you know I wanted I to, go to go back, back and yeah. and you know hang, make sure my mom was okay. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to go to high school in Atlanta because again I'm a singer songwriter, and the opportunities as far as music is concerned in Atlanta are vast. Like there's so much going on there. Huge. So I wanted to move back there to kind of get closer to uh, my recording artist dreams. And it worked out well. I got working yes. with some incredible producers and I got better at my songwriting skills. And it was awesome. Writing music. Do you start mm-hmm. with lyrics or melody? Or both? I start with melody. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. Most times I start with a melody, but it on, varies. On the piano or you sing it out? I just or? sing it out. I sing it out and I'll record it and I will have all these crazy notes on my phone and I'll go back and I'll put lyrics to them. Mm. And I love it very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, is there a time of day for you when you create music or is it whenever, whenever? it comes to me? It's insane. I can be it's asleep. Amazing. You just wake up. I can be like, asleep <laughs> and we'll be <laughs> dreaming. No, I love this. I'm so serious. No, it's crazy. It, I'm a crazy person. Um, <laughs> I'll be, dr- I will be uh, fast asleep and be dreaming about like a song and then I will before I, I don't want to forget it so I will like truly wake up and be like oh shoot let me write let me record that I'll be on the subway thinking of something I have this one song that is the f- I was just walking uh down the street and uh it was just so much going on in New York City from a bunch of cars blowing their horns to uh, a mother and a daughter talking and 
Mm. And it was all so insane, but kind of beautiful. And I just started recording it. I started recording the sounds that were around me. And I wrote one of my favorite songs I've ever written right there walking down the street. It just inspired by like the sounds that I was hearing. Wow. So it can come at any time. Does all of your music fit into a genre? Is it across multiple it's genres? It's across multiple. Is it a new, a new it, genre? You know, I would like to think it was new, but <laughs> but I don't think I'm that cool to just like create something <laughs> fierce. But it's totally it's cross. all over the place. Okay. The only thing I feel like I haven't topped it, tapped into is no rock and roll, no like country music. But mm. I mean, a lot of R&B stuff, a lot of pop stuff, neo soul. I mean, it kind of just... It's just like what I feel, which has been my struggle with releasing projects yeah. is because I I have such a variety of sounds that I've been told I need to kind of, when releasing a project, figure out one type of sound to go with mm. and put it out. So I'll figure that out and soon. That could be the struggle. Oh, it is I've the struggle. That, I've had that too when looking up, like creating this podcast alone. Mm -hmm. Like who is your avatar? What is your one demographic? Totally. And I'm it's like, it's not one person. Right. No, but <laughs> when you have the one person, then there's outliers and you create that tribe because right. you're focusing on the one sound, one yes. person, which I love. Yes. How did Drumline and Big Mama's House 3 yes. come about? So Drumline came about because my mother was pulled onto that project to uh, help with the event planning and with the, uh, I don't know if you, have you seen Drumline? Yeah. So you know there's, there are sororities of fraternities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they were made up. They were completely fictional sororities of fraternities. And my yeah. mother was in charge of coming up with, my mother's a Delta Sigma Theta in real life. <laughs> and so she was in charge of coming up with these fake sororities of fraternities and like making them authentic. So she like helped with that. And, uh, you know, I had two kids and was like, can they come around? You know, one of my daughters is an actress. And so they let me come and be in it. And um, it was awesome. It was yeah. so much fun. And, and I had never done a uh, film before. So I was obsessed with that new way of creating art. I was obsessed with it. Yeah. Um, and then a few years later, uh, Big Mama's house, this is after I moved back to Atlanta. So I'd already lived in Jersey for a few years. Mm. Um, these choreographers came to my high school to audition dancers for the film and I danced for it and I gave it my all and I got cast and then we had about I want to say maybe two weeks of rehearsal learning all the pieces for the for the film and in our final performance of it um, I just was living my absolute best life again mm -hmm. I was so young to be doing that yeah so I just started going in and it. the producers came and they pulled myself and another young woman aside who I went to high school with. Her name was Jasmia, phenomenal dancer. Um, they pulled us aside and they said, we'd like for you guys to read for two characters that are in the, in the movie that we hadn't cast yet. Mm. And we were like, okay. Because we just <laughs> thought we were going to be you know, dancers yeah. in the background. And we read for them and, and they cast us. So we went from being, um, you know, again, just dancers and, you know, uh, uh, day players to being part of the divas, which is the which is a group of friends that um, ruled the school, yeah. the mean girls of the school. <laughs> and it was great. And That's so that so was my cool. first time having lines and uh, with incredible actors like Martin Lawrence, who I was a huge fan of. Um, and I got to, you know, just... Was there any standout conversations with Martin? Ooh. On set or anything? Was there... Oh, my goodness. He's, a, he's crazy. He, <laughs> he was a, a, a crazy man. I don't know. I don't, I'm sure there were, but I don't remember okay. them now. But I know there were standout, like, actions. And one thing I loved about him is that he was this... I mean, by the time Big Mama's House 3 came out, this man is a legend. From his stand-up comedy to Bad Boys to Martin the show. Oh, yeah. And he carried himself like he was just another you know joe schmo on the street on the set huh. he was so kind and normal mm. and i was like okay if martin lawrence can treat people here like he is a nobody i think that i have every right to remain humble and be myself no matter where mm. this this journey takes me he was so nice and mm. you know i just kind of looked up to him that whole time and and his kindness and his like playfulness on set and i was like so inspired by it yeah. it was great are there common like themes of top performers that you you've worked with and are working with Ooh. like backstage rehearsals mm -hmm. is there anything that stands out in your mind yes 
I think I love watching brilliant performers balance the act of being kind and being personable with everyone around them mm. while still making sure that it's clear that this is a job that they take very serious. And I think yeah. that's hard because I think when you set a precedent of like, I'm friendly and I'm open, you know, people want to talk to you all the time. But mm. there's also a moment where you have to kind of get in your own zone and be focused. And some of the most incredible actors that I've had the chance of working with balance that seamlessly. Mm. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, Nick Codero is, a, is an uh, incredible example. He's Tony nominated. He's the star of our show. He is also one of the coolest guys I've ever met. Yeah. But he has this way about him where you feel free and fun talking to him about anything, but you totally respect yeah. when it's time for you to, to shut up and let him get in his moment. Yeah. And therefore, he produces an incredible uh piece of work when he steps out on that stage because he is in it to win it um and i just i love that actors can find that balance of of being kind and open but still being incredibly focused and diligent about their work such a balance oh my goodness yeah um are you have you gotten better at saying no i'm things? working on it it's tricky that's why i'm curious it's so hard and oh my goodness i'm working on it but it's hard because you don't want to let people down. Yeah. Um, but one thing I'm starting to learn is that the the requirements of an of a of an actor, uh, a theater actor specifically, music theater actor specifically, yeah. are borderline insane. They're immense. It's <laughs> insane. <laughs> the requirements are insane. I mean, to sustain a show eight times a week, vocally, physically, mentally, mm. is absolutely insane mm. when you think about it. Um, and you know, for me, my, my workload is starting to increase, um, which is a blessing, nothing to complain about, mm. but I'm, I'm noticing that I just don't have the, the ability to do my show eight times a week, um, you know, rehearse for my next show and, you know, and then do concerts and things. I, I just personally don't have the strength. Some actors I'm sure can, but I know I don't. Mm. And so it's it's something I'm learning mm. to say, no, not right now. And it's very hard, yeah. but you got to do it. And people who love you and respect your art and your craft will totally understand. Yeah. Um, and if they don't, then I think those people are just kind of takers and are rude. It's a good thing you said no in the first place. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I don't want to work with you anyway. That's, you know what? That's very interesting because I've noticed that too. Like, first of all, thank you for saying yes to this. Oh, because you're, you're busy. I'm honored. And you, you're taking time to do this for an extended amount of time. The people who say... What was I just going to say? Oh, my goodness. I just lost it. People who say no. Um, people it's who the say no. way people respond to you when you say no. Oh, yes. That is the telling. Yes. Because then you're like, oh, in the future, you may say yes. Right. A lot quicker. Yeah. And that's the something that I've noticed, too. When I say, to no, to, when I say no to something, mm -hmm. it's the way people respond to it. And Absolutely. Like, that speaks the loudest. Absolutely. In an interaction. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's just, uh, I love that. These are great, great answers. Um, well, I, I want to talk about your process before mm. you go into a show, mm -hmm. like literally half hour call, mm. you know, right okay. before you go on. What do you do? Great. What mental state do you get yourself in? What's I, your process? I try to be r as relaxed as humanly possible. Mm. I love the ladies that I share dressing room with. They are awesome, but they have quickly learned that at half hour, I most likely will put my headphones in and I watch something on Netflix, something that is almost like a brainless thing, a brainless thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll just, you know, kind of put my makeup on and be quiet. Mm. And even though there's a Netflix show playing, um, I'm just relaxing my spirit and relaxing myself so that when it's time to step into this, this person, I feel like I started with a blank slate. Mm. So that I can kind of release the parts of, of Christiani of myself that have nothing to do with Jane and just only focus on the, the parts of myself that are similar to the character that I'm about to portray and just be as open as I possibly can. Because I found the days that I, you know, am running late and, and don't have the time to get as relaxed as I can. My performance is, is, um, it, it, it's just cluttered. Mm. It's cluttered with other other things as opposed to just being in it and being and, and listening and being opening and, and mm. being open excuse me and I don't like that so I just try to get as relaxed as I possibly can um, so that I can start just open and just mm. ready to receive what my 
the other actors are telling me. Um, and that way, when things happen in the audience or, you know, with I, I'm, I'm not thrown off by it. <laughs> Any show I can't, stop. Or you know, like, and we have had a show stop. And, it, and it's, you know, again, when you can relax and be silent and be open, yeah. oh, you're ready for anything. I love that. Is that the way you start your day? Uh, yes, I try. Well, how it depends. do you start your day? Um, so. I start my day with prayer. I wake up. I pray. I thank God for waking me up. Mm. Um, and then, nice. yes, I, you know, you got to. The thing we take for granted is life. Absolutely. Life and health. Life and the, health. It's insane. God. <laughs> it's just that, I don't know, everyone can probably hear this buzzing going on in the background. Sorry, guys. Um, it's literally the thing we take for granted. Mm-hmm. And it's free. Mm-hmm. We did nothing to deserve it. Absolutely. There's no real, I mean, there's explana- explanations, but why your heart is beating today. Right. It's like, it just is. It just is. It just is. So whatever is. you believe in, thank that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And because that is exactly so, what I, I do. That. Sorry, continue. No, <laughs> no. Because so that's important. <laughs> yeah. That is, I mean, it's just... Oh, it's incredibly important. I'm glad to know that you oh. don't take it for granted either. Yeah. But yes, I wake up and I pray. Yeah. Um, and then I will either turn on my, <laughs> I'll either turn on my TV or yeah. watch something on my phone. Just something to kind of, you know, get my mind yeah. right and wake me up. Because okay. when I'm, I'm a very heavy sleeper. So when I wake up, I am groggy. Uh. Um, but then I will, you know, wake up, shower, go to the gym. And uh, get ready for a show. I've noticed that I used to have so many other cool things I did before starting a Bronx Tale. But now, you know, there's not much you can do or else you will tire yourself out before you get to your show. So uh, after I go to the gym, I, I'm most likely just relaxing until it's time for the show. Do you have a text you refer to daily mm. or in the morning? Versus? I don't. Okay. I don't. I don't have any, any text um, that I refer to daily. Um I know there is a, a, a saying that I refer to daily that my dad has given me, which mm. is count it all joy. That I, I think about that every single day that I breathe. Count it all joy. That basically means whatever I go through today, uh. good or bad, I'm going to count it all joyous because it is making me who I am. Yeah. It, is, it is fueling what I'm going to go through today. Yeah. Um, and it's so helpful because there are days where life is just grand and like everything's happening the way it's supposed to happen. And like, ah, oh, it's easy to say, yes, count it all joy. And then there are days where you're like, should I just go back to sleep today? I should I just that. start over <laughs> again? And, but, but I still remind myself, nope, count it all joy. Because I, in that moment, I realized that whatever uh, crappy thing is happening right now, it's mm. happening for a reason. Mm. And it's happening to make me better or, or help me for something else in the future. So count it all joy, y'all. Every Do day. you have a favorite story of life happening for you? Ooh. Or something that... Life happening for me. Hmm. Ooh, yes, I do. So I was auditioning for a show. I don't know if I should even... I'm not going to say the show. It might come up in my story, but whatever. <laughs> so I was auditioning for a show that I was like, this is going to be the job that changes my life. It mm. is the job I've always wanted Yes, Jesus, this is going to be it. And I made it to a final callback. So I said, okay, God, I think, I think that this is, this is the one. Hmm. And um, I get severe audition anxiety. So I hate when I get an email that says, the final callback is this day. This producer is going to be in the room. This pr-. It makes me really nervous. And that's what happened. So I did the audition, and it was horrible. It was horrible. Hmm. Um, I bombed it. I wasn't in it. I was messing up. Lo- it was it was just so bad. And this is songs I've been singing since I was like eight years old. Mm. And I was like, wh- I-, I remember walking out and being like, wh- how? I like, the- I made mistakes that I didn't even think I was capable of making. How <laughs> Jesus no. did I do that? Yeah. I mean, mortified. I was yeah. crying and everything. So fast forward, uh, an audition for King Kong comes up. And um, I thought that this this part was way too large for me to get where I was in my career. So I I took it very serious and I worked hard, but I never thought I'd actually get it. So there was this freeness when I went into the audition room of like, I know you're not going to give this to me. So let me just go go all the way in and have fun. When I found out that I got the show after crying and thanking God, the only thing I could think about was. That's why. That's why. That's why 
all those months ago, I went in for something that I thought had been my destiny since I was mm. eight years old. Mm. And I thought that I was going to nail That's why. Yes. That wasn't for me. That was life and my experience, I say God, mm -hmm. telling me that like that was not your, that wasn't it. Mm -hmm. So no matter how many times you were singing that song when you were eight till now, that was not a part of your journey. Mm -hmm. I have something for you that you never even thought you were capable of doing. I just didn't feel capable of something as iconic as an Ann Darrow, this classic American beauty in King Kong. I did not feel like I was worthy of that. Mm -hmm. And life said, well, you are. You are, girl. <laughs> Give your. I, I, I just. I was like, oh, what? Like, what is life? What that's is incredible. life? That. I mean, that for me was like, wow. That's that's incredible because it happens to me too. If I don't get something I want. Yeah. I used to focus on the fact that I didn't get the yeah, thing. And totally. I would think about it, and it's already passed. It's gone. It's I have gone. someone else, <laughs> and I'm still thinking about it. Right. And it's already closed. <laughs> and I'm like, not realizing though, I'm like, it's just making space. It's just making space. I didn't get that because it's making space for something else. Yep. That you can't even foresee. Fathom. Yep. Can't even fathom. Oh, it's crazy. I, it's crazy. Yes. It is. It's it really awesome, is. It's awesome, but you're like, well, I wish I would have known. That would have saved me a lot of tears and Kleenexes <laughs> and. It really would have. I read this about another thing I read about you that Come I on, love research. and I want to talk about it for a second. To those who much is given, mm -hmm. much is required. Mm -hmm. I want to know, mm -hmm. what does that mean to you? Oh, that means that people are, people who are blessed with an abundance of whatever it's money or skill or intelligence or mm. emotional intelligence, I think that when you have an abundance of something, uh, you then have a job and a duty to to share some of what you have uh, and, and to and to be an example for people who need what you have. Mm. Um, and I, I think that is crucial. Mm. I think that's crucial. It is. Um, when you I mean, God has blessed me. I, you know, at 25 years old, I do not take anything that God has given me for granted. And if I do, I need to get my sugar honey iced tea together because he has blessed me with so much and so I feel like it is now my duty like I am re truly required uh, to lead by example I am required to to help people when I can um, I'm required to to teach um, people who may need uh, mentorship it's my job yeah. um, because I uh, because I know that there are people who who don't have as much right now yeah. and uh, who's gonna help them people who do yeah so I think that that's something that my, my parents told me when I was little. Um, and I, when I was little, I was like, but I don't have anything. <laughs> like, what do you mean too much is given? I don't have anything. To, There's nothing required. There's nothing required. <laughs> right. But, but I didn't realize that, that uh, they were just kind of telling me about the future and, and setting prepared. me up. Get prepared. Mm -hmm. and, and God has given me some pretty amazing stuff. And I know that I am required to lead by example. Who are you when you're at your best? Ooh, Beyonce. No. <laughs> Great. Next question. <laughs> What <laughs> <laughs> I wish. No, I wish. Um, when I'm at my best, I think I am uh, a combination of my sisters, my mother, my cousin, uh, Jesse. My, these are all strong women in my life. Um, Linda Stevenson, uh, which is my drama teacher that I was referring to. I think I'm a combination of those women, truly. Mm -hmm. I think I'm taking all their incredible characteristics, which made me who I am, and they're all, they all come together at one time and I am like at one with who I am constantly supposed to be. You just, this just vision came to me when you said Ooh, this. Come on. Literally, this meaning of standing on the shoulders mm. of those who came before you. Absolutely. That I can picture it as you describe this mm. with being a combination of you're literally standing on the shoulders of what they taught you. Absolutely. And who you are. Absolutely. That's incredible. And I hope they know that. I try to, I try to tell them as much as I can, but um, I, I know I am. Um, this is kind of random but thinking about standing on shoulders i was talking to my mom about uh the character and darrow and king kong and i was saying that you know okay mama you know she was 25 in the night in 1931 so she was born in 1906 and blah, blah blah and my mom stops me and she goes oh well your great grandma cora was born in 1906 1905 1906 one of them and uh you know she has such a uh incredible story so i said tell me about it Long story short, my grandma, uh, Cora, my great grandmother, Cora, lived the life that Ann Darrow would have lived. Had the story of King Kong gone on and on and on and how we get to follow Ann Darrow's character. Mm. That was my grandmother, Cora's, my great grandmother, Cora's life. It was, it was her life. 
And I was like, oh, this, this character is like literally in my blood. And I, it, it, that just reminded oh me of when you talk about standing on people's shoulders. I'm like, I, I, I'm standing on the shoulders of my great grandmother without even knowing it. I, I'd never known wow, any that stories about spoke her. Spoke so loudly to me. It's <laughs> insane. Yeah. It's insane. Like every little minor detail about what my great grandmother went through um, in the early 1900s and living through the Great Depression as a as a Southern Black woman. I mean, her story is insane wow. and it is so similar hmm. to this character that I'm trying to develop and yeah. I was like oh well that's 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 some of the work right there it's already within me yeah. I'm standing on her shoulders and I get to kind of project to a to a, a louder audience some of the things that she would have said had she had a voice for people to hear and it's it bl- it blows me away I mean that is like such a large wide look at the universe conspiring. Ooh, is it? Oh, yeah. Because you couldn't plan that. Mm-mm. Nineteen, going all the way back to nineteen oh six, and like the role belongs to you. It's in. It. it I, I mean, it's like, and there's no, no, like, you know, what is it like? No shade over no. it. It belongs to you. It, I have to. I immediately. It's in you. I imme- It is. It's in my blood. It's I call, incredible. I, I messaged our director, Drew McConey. I immediately took the Facebook <laughs> and I said, Drew, I'm so sorry, but I have to tell you this story. And I told him every little detail, um, you know, so, so the character of Ann Darrow leaves a farm in the Midwest to move to New York City to, to uh, follow her dreams as being an entertainer. My great grandmother, Cora, um, was, and, and so sorry, in rehearsals, we were trying to figure out, well, what did Ann Darrow leave behind on the farm? What did she run from? Why did she leave? other than just wanting to go to New York City, you know, what, what was she leaving? And, and I was like, that's a great question. Well, I found out that my great-grandmother, Cora, uh, at 15 years old, was set up in an arranged marriage. Um, she was married to a man her father's age. She was 30 years her senior, 15 years old. Um, she, so her life was, was changed forever uh, at 15. When her husband passed away, uh, he left his money and his real estate to her. And my great-grandmother, Cora, took that real estate and she started selling properties to black families to start an environment of black homeowners where there weren't any in Sanford, Florida. And I was, I was blown away because that was my great grandmother taking back her power Mm. as a woman and as a black woman. And that was her way of, of saying, I I went through these things when I was younger, I I left those things behind Mm. and this is me coming up and taking back my power. Mm. And that is, that is completely what Andera wants to do. She wants to leave the, the farm behind and take back her power as a woman. And so I said, well, maybe that's what she was leaving. The fear of an arranged marriage, the fear of, of, of having nothing, the fear of being taken advantage of. It is, it is absolutely not by mistake that I have gotten this incredible opportunity to play this role and to tell that story because I know that there are things that my gra- great-grandmother probably wanted to say or needed to say that no one would listen to. And lo and behold, her great-granddaughter, who she never met, gets the opportunity to tell her story. It is, it's, it blows my mind. People are literally going to pay to hear the things that no one would listen to. That's just, oh my Blows my mind. In New York City of all places. <laughs> the, big, the big flash and light city that everybody wanted to get yeah. to. It's insane. Oh my God. It's a blessing. It is. That's oh, thank you for sharing that. Okay, I don't want to hold you up here too much longer, so I want to. We're gonna we're gonna work our way to the end here. Let's do it. I'm just gonna hit you with some curveball questions. Your answers could be long or short. Yes. Changes okay. made in your life that have increased positivity or decreased negativity. Mm. Are there any recently or? Um. Let's see. Um. Hmm. I think yes. I think recently my sisters, our two older sisters, have had children. Uh, and having nieces and nephews has 100% changed my life for the better. Uh, mm. It's made me look at life in a 100%. Everything I look at is more positive because I know that I have little babies that I am like living for, that I want to be an example for. Mm. Um, and it's made me incredibly happy to have these little youngins look up to me. Mm. And uh, it's given me a drive that I never really had. Um, and I'm so much better for it. I love that. Are there common pieces of incorrect advice you hear in your field of work? Yes. Yes. Some of where them are. Where to begin. Where to, truly, where to begin. Yeah. Um, I think some of them are to women. I feel like I often hear uh, people telling women that they have to kind of be complacent and kind of do 
do whatever they can to, to get somewhere in this business. Mm. Um, and that is not true. That yeah. is not true. Um, it's hard to stand up for yourself and it's hard to be a voice, but, but you have to do it. And there are people who will respect you for doing that. There are now more female producers than there have ever been. And they will respect you for that. And I, it makes me sick when I hear people tell women to like practice, like being complacent and practice being silent in order to propel their career forward because that's just not the case. It's just not the case. Um, so that, that always really irks my nerves when I hear people talk about complacency and mm. not saying nothing. Mm. Um, and I think another common mistake I hear people talk about is like the idea of perfection. I think, you know, again, being in music theater, we, we like praise people who are like triple threats and like are the best at everything. And I just don't think that that's necessary for all forms of art and what we do. It's just not necessary. Mm. I think that as long as you are a truthful storyteller and you have truth that you want to bring, I think you will find success. But uh, this idea of being perfect and being, you know, the best in show, I just think is a little detrimental mm. um, to your actual creative process. So when I hear those two things, I'm always like, oh, rolling my eyes in the corner, <laughs> like, child, that ain't right. Yeah. I'm telling them it had to be perfect. It's not true. Yeah, Ugh. you can't. You, you can't. Human. You're going to hurt yourself trying to be. Do you have a favorite failure or apparent failure that set you up for success? Um, I have so many failures. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I think, you know, one of them was that, that story I was telling before yeah. about failing miserably in that audition. Yeah. That, okay. That's been one that sets, that I think has set me up um, because it also helped me enter my next audition process freer and letting yeah. my, and like not putting that much pressure on myself as I did before. Mm. And, and that's helped because now anything I've auditioned for since, I've had this sort of mentality that like, if it's for me, it's for me. Mm. And if it's not, it's not. So mm. there's no reason for me to be so adamant about being, you know, exactly what these people want because you don't, I don't know what they want. <laughs> yeah. So if it's for me, it's going to be for me. Do you have, um, I love that. That mm -hmm. speaks very loudly to me. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to talk about it for too long, but I love that. Oh yeah. Um, I don't want to speak on it for too long, <laughs> but I love that. <laughs> Mistakes made that have proved essential in learning. Are there any that come to mind? Yes. Oh my goodness. Um, I think some mistake that I've made is I, like I said, I have wanted to do this for a very long time. I've always taken it very serious. Um, and I think that I can be a little single minded when it comes to success. And I get so caught up in wanting to do my best work that I think I can miss moments that are happening around me with people that I love. Um, and so I had to learn that you can be super, super focused on your goals and focus on your, uh, your aspirations and focus on your hard work. But I think it's important to kind of look up sometimes from your script or look up from, from whatever you're learning and absorb the greatness that's around you because you can really miss out on things. And that's a, that's a mistake that I have made. And, it, and it's an easy mistake to make when you want something so badly. Um, but, you know, it's important to make sure that even though you want to be great, mm. you keep your moral compass strong and you focus mm. on how to make sure that you're treating other people with, with kindness uh, along the way and not missing, you know, crucial moments of, of opportunities around you. The little things. Mm -hmm. I love that. Do you have a most gifted book or a book you'd recommend? <gasps> oh. Favorite book? Oh, my gosh. I love books. I have so many books that I'd recommend. Mm, mm, mm. Let me see. Um, ooh. <sighs> Between the World and Me between, uh, by Ta-Nehisi Coates is truly one of my favorites. Um, and I recommend it just because it's so specific. Um, I think right now there's so much going on in the world that we talk about things kind of generally. And like even I did when I first started talking about treat people with love. And that's true. But it's general. Mm -hmm. And in this book, it's this guy's specific point of view about his specific encounters with injustice in the world. And because of its specificity, anybody can relate to it. The more specific you are, I think, the more it speaks to people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I recommend that anybody who is confused by the world and wanting to know what they can do as an individ individual to make things better mm -hmm. should read that book because it is excellent. I love it. It's excellent. That's great. That's really great. Do you have a most worthwhile investment, be it <gasps> skill set, time, or money? Mm, yes. <laughs> I think that it is, I would say... I would say your, I would say physical health, 
and I don't and I don't mean about looking snatched all the time and like be being I don't mean that I just mean like genuinely taking care of yourself and I think it's worth the investment to listen to your body uh, because it is all we have in this world and I, I think that the more uh, attention you pay to your physical health you're just adding time to your life to, to just be here longer and I think it's from what I found to be my most prized investment is is going to the gym um, and taking the time to listen to what my body needs to work at its highest capacity. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're literally investing in your 60, 70, 80, 90 year old self. Oh, yeah. Today. Oh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It. It's, it's important. So true. I mean, you're investing on your health now, too, but it's that future. But it pays that off. Yes. Exactly. Because yes. you see Cheetah Rivera. She is still living. And so I ma- it makes me think yes. that when Cheetah Rivera was 25, she... I don't think was not paying close attention to how healthy she was being. Um, and now she is uh, better than ever. You know, I think the same thing about Paul McCartney. T- totally. Literally. Totally. He I looks saw great. him with that. Do you see car karaoke car thing? Yes. The other day? It was like a 20 minute episode yes. he did with James Gordon. It's and I was brilliant. just watching him and I was like, this guy went through these, the drug epidemics and the psychedelics. And I don't think he did them <laughs> at all. He is on it because he is. He is it. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't miss a beat. I, yeah, I get the impression that he wrote and sang about it, but didn't participate mm-hmm. because he's like there. He's there, and that's how I want to be. Yeah, I want to be with it. Longevity. You want know people taking advantage of you? Nobody's taking advantage of Paul McCartney. No. Nobody. Who no one. Allow that. <laughs> no. Do you, metaphorically speaking, have a word or a phrase that you'd put on a billboard for millions of people to see? Ooh, you know, I do, and I think it's going to be. It's, it's a long one. Is that okay? That's great. Okay, I think it's going to be what I was saying earlier, which is what is for you is for you. What is set in your path, no one can take away or destroy. That is, that is my mantra. That is something that I believe in so much. Um, and I think it's true. And that what is set in my path in this life is is gonna is gonna be there, and it's my job to stay on the path and stay focused. Um, but but no one can take that from me, and that goes for everybody. And I think if you if you truly believe in that and truly know that, it'll save you from the competition, from the competitive thoughts, from the jealousy, from the heartache. It'll save you from all that because you know that you're perfect, and what you're supposed to get, you're gonna get. It's already set. It's already been preordained for just you. Christiani, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Literally, this is awesome. Thank you. Thank you so I much. I feel like we could do a part two, three, four, five. Listen, we'll always. We'll have to touch back. We'll have to do we another must. one. We must. Uh, where can we find you? You guys can find me, I feel like, everywhere. I'm on Twitter as Christiani Pitts. I'm on Instagram as Christiani World. My mother came up with that. And I am on Facebook as Christiani Pitts. And uh, yeah. That's where I'm at. And you can find her streets. at the Long Acre Theater. Yes, yeah, so you can find me at, uh, in a Bronx Tale yes. um, at the Long Acre Theater on 48th <laughs> Street um, until July 15th, unfortunately. So come out um, because yeah. I'm almost done, um, which is very sad. And then you can find me at the Broadway Theater nice. uh, starting October 5th. Yes. This is incredible. Thank you for sitting down with me. Thank you for Thank having you me. Thank you for talking to me about all this wide range all the things mass of stuff yes. this has been really great this has been awesome thank you so much ladies and gentlemen christiani pitts you've been listening to entertainment x the podcast you can follow entertainment x on instagram at underscore entertainment x underscore if you haven't yet go to apple podcasts and subscribe rate and review this podcast Join Clay next week for another curiosity conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening.